Hello, this is Robert University and in tutorial number five, we're going to kind of wrap up what we were talking about last time and move on to composition, another founding principle of graphic design. So you can see that uh, I've added color to my very basic logo from last time. It's been pared down significantly the logo is a very subtle one now all it retains from the original plan was that uh, uh, substituted a a rosette or a ribbon a gold ribbon a blue ribbon a golden blue ribbon uh, for the eye and design i haven't um i haven't um, um devalued the letter i itself i chose not to put the little v shape in the bottom to enhance the idea that it's a, rib a ribbon as it was visually unsettling all i've done is i've added a gold rosette or badge <clears throat> in in substitution for the normal dot of the lowercase i and i've chosen to make the type itself in a dark blue color along with the closest thing i can get to gold really in a uh, software program and a two-dimensional design software program so this is the logo we're starting with today now if i zoom out you can see that i've got a lot of things here ready for us today just a word about the old robert university logo we've abandoned this for a couple of reasons. Number one, Robert University as a brand for these videos really is um, um, uh, not to the point. What these videos are really all about is graphic design. And what we're trying to learn here is how to be a better graphic designer and learn Adobe Illustrator at the same time. So we had this kind of, well, well-intentioned kind of symbol here where we picked up on the Adobe uh, a corporate kind of uh, rounded corner square shape with the rosette uh, functioning as the tassel that might come off a university um, mortar board or hat that you wear when you graduate. And I substituted RU. You know, the thing is, as well intentioned as this was, it was flawed in a number of ways. Number one, RU doesn't mean anything, right? you know, Robert University, are you okay? The other thing is, is that this directly, are you, infringes upon Adobe Rush, which is a program that's uh, made to uh, produce and edit video very quickly for social media sites. So this is out. You'll never see this again. In fact, what I'm going to do is delete it. Never to be seen again. OK, so that's out. So what I want to show you is that. I've got kind of this master copy of my logos now. And I've got this color version and that's fine. But whenever I create logo types or logos to be used in a variety of ways, I'll always do a color version. Yeah, and then a black and white version as well. Now I want to show you something about the black and white version which you've prepared down here if you go up to view and outline you can see that my vector work is not as clean really as it should be although this badge overlaps the p and, and we can see the whole badge and everything this overlapping of vector lines here is not ideal now whenever we um create artwork in using vector uh, vector curves and lines, et cetera, and points. What we want to do is always make it as clean as possible, because although it might not seem to matter right or at this specific moment, it may matter in the future. So what I'm going to do is create this one color version of my little graphic design lo logo type and make it very clean. Now, right now, everything is ungrouped. All my letters are ungrouped. This is uh, functioning as one line down here, and that's fine. OK, but what I want to do is this. If, since this is only going to be used for one color, I want to clean up my artwork. Now, it's not um, 
it's very important that you, like I said, always keep your vector artwork as clean as possible. Now, in the two color versions, I won't do this because I need to be able to make this little rosette or this bad. But for my one color variations, what I want to do is clean this up a bit by zooming in and zooming out a bit, which is Alt magnifying glass, yes. Right. So that's just about right now. All right. So what I want to do is uh, go to where you can find all your palettes and everything. They're either in view or window. Now I'm looking for my Pathfinder palette. Now we touched on this before, and this is something you really want to look into. <clears throat> Very useful, especially in composition exercises. What the Pathfinder menu is all about is taking basic vector shapes and combining them, using them to uh, subtract from other shapes, etc. What I want to do is combine this outside, <clears throat> excuse me, vector of the uh, <clears throat> P shape, and I want to combine it directly with the rosette. So it's just one vector outline. So what I want to do is with my select tool, <clears throat> excuse me, select the P and also hit shift and select the rosette. Okay, and if I come up here to unite, watch what happens right here, okay? When I hit unite, all of a sudden that becomes one vector image. All right, you think, okay, that's great. What's the difference? Why should I take the time to do that? Well, I'll show you in a second. Finder tools, there's quite a variety of them and they all work in essentially the same way. So you can either uh, combine, uh, you unite vector images, you can take one and subtract that shape from another. Uh, really quite useful if you're designing with shapes, and that's what we're going to be doing today. Now, the thing about the Pathfinder menu is this, it can be a little bit confusing because although when you unite two objects like this, it doesn't much matter which order you select them in. If you're using these other ones, minus, front, et cetera, intersect, exclude, and these divide, et cetera, it's very important that you select one object before another. And if you don't get the desired result when using the Pathfinder tools, try to uh, go back and change the sequence in which you select different vector paths which you're going to manipulate with pathfinders. But this has worked for us and that's cool. And I'm going to get rid of, uh, get rid of this, uh, this um, uh, menu and I'm going to hit Alt or I'm going to hit keyboard command Z or Z and get my magnifying glass and hit Alt, which changes it to a minus and zoom out a bit. Okay, now I have a very clean vector image. So what I want to do is, first of all, I want to group all these letters by marking around them and coming up to object and selecting group. I'm going to uh, leave these two items separate. They, they're all right. And you see I have them lined up right against this guideline over here. So now if I go to view, now if I uh, select this and open up um, my um, swatch palette here, if I wanted to tone this back, say, to a middle gray, and here's all your grays on the standard swatch palette. Uh, maybe go back to a medium gray, et cetera. OK, something like that. Um, or change it, the whole thing, to uh, red or something. You see, it all works as one thing. All right, so let's just say that I wanted to make this whole thing uh, blue. All right. OK, fine. It all works as one. I'm going to show you the effects palette up here. You hit effects. Now, the effects in Adobe Illustrator, you should just leave them alone, <laughs> really, especially these down here. All right, these are mostly used. Uh, these are made in Photoshop. It's just like using vector things in the bitmap program Photoshop. Just a general rule, just stick to the vector things, the, the vector software when you're working in Illustrator. And you've got all these up here and 
honestly, I, I never use them. I never use warp or rasterize or anything, right? The only, only effect that I ever, ever use, and this is just a cheap graphic trick, really, and and usually just the the result of a of a visual designer um, not having thought through a problem and looking for an instant kind of clever trick to use. Drop shadows can be useful at times, so I'm just going to show you this. And if you want to go and play with all these other effects, great, but don't rely upon them. I'd rather you ri uh, rely upon your brain and um, uh, the composition of meaningful images rather than kind of cheap graphic tricks. OK, so I'm going to show you a drop shadow. If you ever want to use it, if you click on it, you get a, a dialog box. And uh, this is quite useful, actually. Opac opac opacity, of course, determines how thick the shadow is or how dense it is. And your X and Y offsets determine which direction your shadow is going to go and how far. And the blur also does, does that, OK? And of course, uh, we want it to be in black. So if you just hit the default settings, once you select your object, <laughs> if you just hit the uh, default settings, yeah, you can see that you get a certain kind of drop shadow. And I'm going to deselect. I'm going to hit OK and deselect. OK, that's fine. You can see that. Um, the blue and the black shadow don't work so great. And if I click on this and, and make my text white, you can see that that has a, a certain appeal. Yeah. OK, so drop shadows can be useful. What I'm going to do is I'm going to I actually quite like that, believe it or not. So I'm going to uh, click on the whole thing. I'm going to hit Control C and Control V. And I get another copy, and I'm just, I'm just going to stash that over here off the board and save. So, okay, so we've got we've got a one color version, and if I go back and I make my text uh, a light gray and get rid of my drop shadow, etc. Okay, that's fine. Um, all right, so. One color artwork, drop shadows, etc. The thing is, is if you haven't combined your badge with your P shape before you hit the drop shadow button, this would be a big mess right here. It would be you'd have two overlapping drop shadows, and it wouldn't give you the idea, the um, uh, the look that you're searching for. So. Uh, just a heads up on on how that works. Let's just out of curiosity see what that looks like in tan. Right, not that great. How about a bright red? You can see that the red and the black. There's not that difference between them on the uh, uh, on the color spectrum. So it looks as if if you're using a drop shadow on graphic design, you might want to stick to a lighter color. Let's see this light blue. All right, it's okay. Anyway, let's move out of that. So let's move out of this. All right, so we've got graphic design. Let's group that together. I'm going to hit Control G. I quite like that, actually. But it only works because we've designed the words and the artwork correctly. So now we've got sort of a one color version. Uh, a two color version, etc. And, and we can begin to work with these different variations. All right, so let me just zoom in here. Hit keyboard command Z and bring up graphic design. OK, so what do we do now? Well, OK, we've got this logo. Now let's let let's move a bit further. Okay, let's talk about the uh, about composition and about how to how to make exciting grids and formats in which maybe this graphic design logo might 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 be presented in two dimensions. Just very very basic uh, 
layouts that will help you to make your work a bit more dynamic. So if I zoom out to my page, to page level, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to take all this artwork and move it off to the side. Look at the ungrouped somehow. Object group, okay, just move that off. And this, all one piece, we'll move that off. All right, now we've got these guidelines that are hanging around. And if we go up to view and um, um, uh, guides, we can clear those guides and get rid of them. You can see that I've got my rulers open. If you don't have your rulers on your page, go to view and rulers and show uh, this. If I didn't have them, I would say show rulers and make sure that you uh, have those turned on. Again, my guidelines are a dark blue color. If you don't like the light blue color, yes, come down to preferences under edit and you can adjust all of the user interface uh, bits about uh, Adobe Illustrator here. And this is the place where I changed my guidelines from light blue to dark blue. Okay. Now you may have seen that I've got this poster over here hiding. And I want to use this as an example of the use of really good composition within, in this case, a poster. I'm going to get rid of my uh, swatch palette here. OK, uh, this is a public domain, really authentic version of an 1891 Toulouse-Lautrec poster for uh, the Moulin Rouge, promoting a specific dancer named La Galou and her dance partner, the Snake Man. Now, I'm using this one instead because it's more authentic. You can get the feel of this. Uh, poster from 1891. There were about 3,000 of these printed. They're highly prized now in museums all over the world. Now this is a this is a bad reproduction of it, but you can see here that the uh, the text of the top bit is in place. Where in this version that I'm showing you, it's cut off. So this is the poster. So at the top we've got text arranged in sort of a random way, not using proper typefaces, but the illustrator Toulouse Lautrec chose to illustrate his text, uh, not without careful consideration. You can see he's imitating sans serif typefaces of the day, the condensed upper case sans serif here and an extended uh, sans serif here using an initial cap for the, the beginning G. Yes, as I said, this is a poster for an ongoing set of performances at the Moulin Rouge in Paris in 1891. But what I want to, what I want to show you is this. If you look at this poster, and if you're interested in this, um, go look up Toulouse Lautrec. Very, very interesting individual. Um, a noteworthy personality from um, the 1890s in Paris, which was a, a time of great change and artistic expression. So, I mean, that's a that's a whole subject on itself in, in itself. But what I want you to do is to just look at this poster and how Toulouse Lautrec has actually visually arranged the items within this very similar to an A4 format. There's a signatures down here and that's fine and some extra text down here and that's fine. But let me just point out the different um, techniques that Lautrec uses to draw our eyes into the poster and to allow us to ascertain or comprehend the main point of the poster, which is the star of, of the performance, um, the glutton is what uh, La Galou tra uh, translates into, into English. Okay, so she's the, the premier dancer of the show and this is her unofficial dance partner known as the snake man who evidently could move his body in ways that were astounding and um, quite complimented uh, the dancer herself but look what Lautrec does first of all he establishes scale in his poster by putting the snake man here 
in re, in a, a very flat format without any color adding dimension to act almost as a curtain that we then go beyond to see the primary dancer here in the center of the poster. The other thing that I want you to take special note of is the use of the perspective in the floorboards. You can see it's a single point perspective system. All of these lines would come together somewhere up here in a vanishing point. They create dimension, but most importantly, through their sort of dynamic um, a positioning. They lead our eyes directly into the poster and what's in the center of the poster? The star of the show. And is she in flat monochromatic color? No, she's in, uh, she has the most color integrated into her figure than any other uh, body in the, in the poster. You can see that our eyes are drawn immediately to her red stockings, yes, and her red polka dot shirt. And this is the whole intent, that Lautrec draws us in past the curtain of the snake man, using the perspective of the floorboards directly into the subject of the poster, which is not placed dead center, moved a little bit off to the left, yes. And then there are these yellow things. What are those? This is the gas lights that, that uh, provide a warm glow in the Moulin Rouge. And this one is evidently in the foreground, uh, possibly uh, out of context of the ceiling where it might not, uh, where, where, where it might not actually be. But again, adding a curve and dynamics and something to, uh, 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 again, draw our attention into the main bit of the center of the poster. <clears throat> then my favorite part, is this background that the trek provides this background of silhouettes of the audience of the moulin rouge men in top hats and women in uh, fancy dress yes all sorts of different personalities but flat like it like the curtain in the back of a stage and in this very simple way toulouse the trek makes uh, gives motion to the poster adds visual excitement that our eyes follow and and as a result comprehend what's going on and the point that he's trying to make we look at the dancer here's her name right above her head yes at the moulin rouge okay enough about that now let's talk about how we might integrate these same kind of things <clears throat> excuse me into let's just say an A4 graphic that contains our graphic design words, okay? So what I'm going to show you is this. I'm going to show you how to create a professional start to constructing a document that might be printed or exported or whatever um, <clears throat> for many different um, uh, uh, final purposes, et cetera. But this is how you go about constructing, and in this case, an A4 layout using rulers and guidelines. So I'm going to use my magnifying glass here, and I'm going to very top corner of my page, okay? And I'm going to get it right over here. I want to position it in a certain way. I want the top corner very close to my guidelines. Okay, now check this out. Right now, my guidelines are set on zero right here at the edge of my page and they begin one, two, three, four, yes. And uh, I'm not quite sure what scale this is in. I thought it was millimeters, but these could be centimeters. OK, and again, the zero starts at the very top of my page. Excuse me. OK, say I've been messing around with my guidelines and, and these are all um, set in a different way. Yes, one way to reset your rulers so that they suit you is to come up here to the very top corner of where these rulers intersect and left click with your select tool and drag. And you see that you get these crosshairs. Now, wherever I leave these crosshairs, my ruler will reset to zero in both dimensions, wherever that X is. Now, 
I quite want them to be on zero up here in this corner, so I'm going to leave them where they are for now, but that's how you reset. Okay, so we've got zero. Now what I want to do is first make a border along my page so that nothing of importance goes beyond that border, but I want that border to be um, mathematically even and correct. So it, what I want to do then is to take my select tool and left click and drag from this top ruler and let's just say we're going to make a a five millimeter border now you can see i'm going up and down over here and this is why we zoomed so close up in the top corner i'm going to use the uh, larger mark in between zero and one and drop a um, guideline there i'm going to do the same thing on the left from the left hand side and I'm going to make sure they're even. Now I'm going to zoom out to page level and you can see that these were indeed that my guidelines are impossibly small. Okay so if I wanted to um, uh, actually make these centimeters yes uh, 10 mil millimeters equals a centimeter. So I don't want it to be quite that large. So what we're going to do is we're going to come up here to this setting on my rulers, okay? We're going to use five guidelines to establish our border. Right now, what I used was half a millimeter and that's why it's so tiny okay now if i do my select tool and i try and pick up this this guideline it doesn't work okay so what i have to do is come up here to view and guides and uh, i have them naturally set on locking guides so that they don't move but i want them to be able to move so i'm going to click unlock guides and i'm just going to take this guideline and move it over to the five millimeter mark and the millimeter mark down here. And now I'm going to zoom out, see how that looks. Okay, much better border. Now, how do I do that for the other two sides? Well, I zoom in in my lower right-hand corner. Okay, and I get this corner. It's much easier if you can actually position your work close to the guides. So now we've got this crazy thing, you know, an A4 is 210 millimeters wide, <clears throat> etc. So what I want to do is reset my guides to make it easy to make a five millimeter border. And I'm going to click on these crosshairs up here and drag it right down here to my lower right hand corner. And there I've reset my I've reset my <clears throat> rulers. So now I can make sure that I have a five millimeter border here and a five millimeter border here. All right, now I zoom out. Okay, it's essential to first make a border for your page. All right, now, okay, 210 millimeters. If I wanted to make a center line, right down the middle of my page. That would mean that I would want to have another guideline at 105 millimeters. So I'm gonna drag this over here and go back to zoom. Okay, so now I've got a center line and I've got a border. Okay, I'm going to hit save by the way. OK. Now, what about if I wanted to split my page center from top to bottom? Well, it's not so easy to divide um, the uh, total length of a um, A4 page. You see, an A4 page, the length of it is like 297, 298 millimeters, somewhere in there. 
298, I think it is. And that's not as easy to split as uh, 210 millimeters. I want to show you a really good sort of um, practical way to divide up a page if you don't want to constantly do the mathematics and calculate and place um, uh, and place guidelines somewhere along these rulers. So for instance, if I want to divide my page in half and I don't want to mess with fractions of millimeters, I'll show you a very simple method about how to do that. It's using the space tools, yeah, or, or the, um, um, the rectangle tool. First make a rectangle. OK, now let's give that an outline color. And to do that, we click on outline color down here in the lower left. And right now there is no color. Uh, we could just use solid black from this palette and that's OK. And if we wanted to and if we wanted to um, change the width of the stroke, you know, you go to window and. Uh, 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 window and find stroke which is here it's all it's linked with the transparency panel and if i wanted to you can see it comes by default as one point i could make that really thick and i don't want to do that i want it to be just one point so that's how you would change that thickness if you'd like to now check out this with it selected i hit control c and control not v because if I hit control V, my copied image will go right into the center of my workspace. I want to hit control F and that will place a duplicate image directly on top of the original image. And with my arrow keys now, only with my arrow keys, I make it so that um, I have a duplicate image, the same exact size with a small space in between the two objects. So if you ever want to divide space up properly into two or three sections, try it this way. Now I'm going to go to smart guides because they'll help me here and I'm going to click those and I'm going to make sure both of these are that I'm going to move them up till they intersect with my top guideline. Then I'm just going to stretch them down here until they intersect with the bottom guideline. And then I'm going to zoom in to the gap between them and I'm going to bring a new guideline down here so it's right in the middle of that gap and leave it and go back to my my uh, page and so i can just get rid of these now and my page without doing it mathematically and driving myself crazy um, i've now split the page in half from top to bottom okay good start now if we wanted to have two columns of text in the bottom, we know that our borders are five millimeters. We know that we have a center line here. If we zoom into our above ruler, yes, we see we're on 105 here. If we wanted to make a gap between columns of type, that was similar to the border that we are using on the edge of the page, then we would try and make this into a five millimeter gap. So we have to zoom in on the border, a little, on, on the ruler a little bit here, and you can see our center is right at 105. So if I wanted to make a five millimeter gap between my two columns of type, that means I have to have two and a half uh, millimeters over here. You can see it starts to get quite tedious with these small sizes. I'm just going to do the best I can. Just put one here and go two and a half over here and that makes a total of five millimeters. You can see that they're just about equal and fit on screen. So now you can see I have two columns of text. So if I wanted to be just really basic and, and straightforward, I might take my logo and put it up here as a header, yes, and then construct two columns of type down here, start maybe at the middle of the page, etc. And all of a sudden you have a very basic layout, okay? And if I uh, created columns of text, 
let's just say. Uh, I do a lorem ipsum deal and I just type stuff in. And it's 12 point and that's all right. And let's change it to maybe a body style that goes well with my big heavy. With my big heavy uh, headline, let's say Gaudi or Street School Book is a good one. OK, and I bring this up here and my smart guides are on, so they should hook up exactly. And put in some dummy type. Never use justified type unless there's a very good reason. That means um, that the type goes right up to the borders, both uh, on the left and the right. Stick 99 out of 100 times. Stick with flush left copy. You really can't go wrong. Yeah, and the rag at the end is what makes your copy interesting. All right, so I'm just going to type this in. I've got a little paragraph. Now I can copy that. Hit Control C. Place my cur cursor at the end of the paragraph. Hit Enter. Hit Control V. Control V. Control V. V. Right. OK, so a nice boring. Two column format. Right. So here we go. Even though it's boring, <clears throat> you always want to make it uh, structurally sound. So let's make these columns of type at least line up with the borders. With the guidelines. OK. Yawn. All right. A very, very basic. <clears throat> it almost looks like the page out of a book. OK, that's great. That's wonderful. Let's. Uh, let's uh, uh, save that. All right. And what we're going to do now is break this all down. So as usual, when you're working on Illustrator, hit control C whenever you've got something that you want to save and you see that my my guidelines have been illuminated. You see, I've actually selected them as well. Now, I don't want them, so I'm going to deselect everything and go to view and guides and lock guides. And now if I marquee all around this and hit control C and zoom out and hit control V, and just, who knows, that might be quite useful at some point as I'm working. So I'm just going to put that over here and hit um, control G. And I'm going to hit save. OK, so let's take all of this, all of these bits and pieces. Let's get rid of Robert. Goodbye, Robert University. Let's zoom in on our page again. All right. So I'm going to now um, uh, unlock the guides because I want to work with them some more. Let's just say I want a three column format. OK. So I'm going to deselect this guide and get rid of it and deselect this guide, and get rid of it. OK, so I've got this center line and this center line can be both useful and not useful. So I'm going to use my. My. Uh, a rectangle tool. And. Give myself a black stroke and hit control C and F. And. Zoom in. I'm going to hit Control C and F again. And that's an equal space. That's good. I'm going to select them all. 
Zoom out. Sit on screen. And now I'm going to divide <clears throat> my page into a three column format. I'm just going to stretch this until it intersects and look. Now I've got a perfect way to divide this into three columns by putting a guideline right in the gap between these boxes. And I'm going to zoom out. Fit on screen. And now my center line is becoming irrelevant, so I'm going to get rid of that. Now I've got this three column grid. I'm going to get rid of these boxes because I can make them so quickly. There's no need to keep them. All right, so I also need to have um, uh, space for my text to fit in within these three columns. So I'm again going to come up to the top and make a five millimeter gap on either side of these boxes. All right, now look, a five millimeter uh, um, set of guidelines on either side of that side of that center line you see i'm not lining up exactly with um, anything in the ruler so i could easily now just come over here with my reset section yes go to zero and then make my guides what i'm looking for is Two and a half millimeters on either side of this center line. All right. I'm going to just do the same thing over here quite quickly. I'm going to reset my scale. And make a guideline. Two and a half millimeters on either side. Then we'll zoom out. All right, now I've got a three column grid. Okay, so I want to move my uh, I'm do is find those bits and pieces from before. And here they are. All right, so if I wanted to use my 12 point text, I would uh, change the, uh, uh, change the um, um, line length. I'm just going to hit shift just for the purposes of this. I'm going to make my text small and get rid of this. You can see that you can't really shift anything unless you get properly off the board. And I'm going to copy some of this. And that didn't work, so I'm going to delete that. And we'll make sure there's a cursor going here. And Control C, go down. And place my cursor at the end. Hit Enter. Hit Control V. Place my cursor here and get rid of everything else. Hit Control C. And me, and we can get three columns a time. Okay, so you can see how this works. Okay, now I have <clears throat> an incredibly, incredibly boring three column grid. Okay, now this is what I want you to consider. Um, if you wanted to use, uh, there are many, many, many different grids out there. I mean, you can use the rule of thirds, you can use Fibonacci sequence, you can add any of those kind of uh, mathematical equations you want. I'm sure Illustrator has some blank grids somewhere that you can just pop in. What I'm trying to show you is how to make custom grids. All right, now take for instance this. What do you say we throw out the standard three column grid? Okay, and shift these grids a bit make it so that 
we have two nice big columns. and a third narrow column on the right hand side. Let's do that. Now, uh, we can tell from, from um, the width of these columns. But first of all, I'm gonna get rid of these guidelines here. All right, and I'm going to make a new grid based on this uh, format. If I select my text, yes, you can see that it gives you a box around its widest point. So I'm going to use this technique to create a grid based on the size of the intuitive kind of type that I've created. I'm just going to bring a guideline over to line up here. I'm going to click on this and do the same thing, just lining up on the border on the edge of the text block. Okay. Right. So it's a different way that you can make a grid quickly. Now, if I want the gap between my larger two columns and my, my final third column to be correct, what I can do is this. I can select these two guidelines. I can hit Control C and V just like anything else and drag them over here and line them up. Now, I've now got two guidelines here, so I'm going to get rid of one and I'm going to zoom out. All right, so now I've got a three column grid. Now you can see that my border is a little too small for this for this grid size. So you might want to go back there and adjust that. And that would be perfectly cool. What I'm what I'm trying to show you is how to come up with a grid visually and make Adobe Illustrator work for you. Okay, we'll leave that. OK, so now we've got a two column grid. Now over here, we might make a very bold sans serif face, which maybe should pick up on the same font that we've used for a subhead or a tagline for our graphic design uh, logo. So now we're using Century School Book for our text. You know that we have this Franklin Gothic extra bold text here and here. For instance, if we wanted to put some photos or some details over in this column, um, uh, the perfect typeface now would be to uh, revisit that original font and make it Franklin Gothic heavy. We want to limit the amount of fonts and variations that we have throughout the document. Right now we've got a, two sizes. We've got three sizes of Franklin Gothic, which isn't ideal, but quite necessary and one size of uh, Century School Book for the body copy. So if I wanted to use this as my place, all out sidebars, captions, photos, whatever, you can see that I've got a kind of a more vibrant logo going, uh, thing going. Okay, let's just leave it at that. We've got graphic design, how to be a better illustrator. Now, instead of the standard three column grid, we've got a two column grid, which gives us lots of in room for information. Yes, our borders are not correct. If I had more time in this uh, in, in this logo or in, in this uh, tutorial, what I go back is I would now match my outside borders with kind of this idealized gap between my columns and make it all look all right. We can we can even start that down here. Yeah. Uh, it's not bad to have a, a wider margin at the bottom of your page. Standard, what I've found to be very useful is to have three left, right, and top margins to be the same, and, and perhaps one and a half times or twice as much at the bottom. It's uh, just a nice rule of thumb that usually uh, works quite well. Okay, now how are we going to make this? Okay, save. How are we going to make this? <clears throat> how are we going to get this dynam dynam dynamicism that Toulouse-Lautrec gets in a, just a page without a dancer and uh, an audience and all these things? Okay, well, this is how. The secret to having really kind of cool 
flat, two-dimensional, boring old, you know, normally boring old A4 layout is to get something moving in the background, to break the borders, to, to shift the axes somehow. So I want to show you how to do that. Now, let's just say we've got another pair of guidelines over here, here, all right? Now, what I want to show you is this. If I select them both, I can come up here to object and transform and rotate them just like any other object. Now, I could rot them, rotate them 45 degrees and that would be uh, like a big X in the back of the screen. I, I want to set that X, those axes off a bit. So I'm going to go with 35 degrees and hit enter. And now look, if I pick this up and move it, maybe to here, yes? All of a sudden in the background, we've got movement, okay? Now that's, now just like Toulouse-Lautrec focused our attention on the dancer by using the floorboards, I want to focus our attention on the words graphic design by putting this X perhaps right in the center of graphic design or up here somewhere. Let's just put it right here. Okay. All right. So now we have a much more dynamic logo. And if we wanted to um, somehow get another idea back here, uh, this would be the way to do it. Now, perhaps if I was doing some sort of visual logo that involved uh, other shapes, yes, I might use the ellipse tool and I might hit shift and get a perfect circle. I might hit shift and alt or um, uh, shift and control, shift, control and alt, shift and alt, yes. Here we go. <laughs> Cancel. Shift and Alt. Watch what happens now. If I hit Shift and Alt, I get this different kind of cursor. Yes. And what that does is make a perfect circle that starts from the center point in which you place the cursor. So if I did that right here in the center point of my X and hit, was it Shift and Alt? Yes, Shift and Alt and made a big uh, circle that maybe goes off the page and aligns with something. Maybe, maybe it doesn't align with anything particular. And I open up my window, my uh, swatch libraries, and go to my color books and my Pantone solid coated color. And now these colors aren't going to be right, but just for brevity's sake, I'm going to start putting them in here, yes. And let's just say I want to use a, uh, a lighter palette in the background so that my body copy can be seen. So as we talked about before, each color is in a range of, of seven different uh, uh, tones or values. Let's just pick a light blue and look, it's right in the front of everything. Well, if I want to change the stacking, the, the stacking level on my uh, layout, with my object selected, I come up to object and arrange and send to back. OK, great. So let's send that to back. Uh, let's have a color that is, is fills our entire page in the background. So I'm going to use the rectangle tool and mimic the, uh, uh, the page size exactly. And I'm going to make another very light color, let's say purple. And I'm going to hit object and arrange and send that to back. OK, now with my uh, pen tool and my and my uh, 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 smart guides on, I'm going to actually put that pen right here on these intersections of guidelines and make a shape by closing it. Remember when you use the pen tool, if you 
bring it close enough to your original node or point, you'll get this little zero at the side of your pen tool, and uh, that means you've made a connection, yes? Yeah? So I'm going to click that, and I'm going to make this a light green, and I'm going to send that. to the back where I can't see it. So I'm going to bring that up a layer. I want that in front of my back purple, my color in the purple. So I'm going to hit arrange. Um, uh, um, and if you can see that there's keyboard commands, shift control um, brackets, yes. If I want to just uh, bring forward one level, my my triangle that I just made, it's control plus uh, open uh, right hand black brackets. So if I uh, click on that, you can see my stacking level has changed. My stacking layer has changed. This color is not looking very good. I made a mistake with my with my pen tool. If you do that, uh, click on the uh, select tool and you can get rid of it. change this to something else besides pink, maybe a uh, very light tan. Tan's quite a quite a difficult color in the, uh, in the uh, uh, Pantone system. Let's use a uh, let's use a kind of a, a light green perhaps. All right, so anyway, this is how I start to make some sort of dynamic layout just using shapes. Now check this out. I know I've been going on uh, for a while here, and I kind of want to bring this to a close, uh, although there's so much more to um, uh, cover. If I wanted this circle to end right at the very borders of my, uh, of my layout, yes, let me show you how that might work. First, I'm going to move it a bit just to make things a little simpler. Okay, say I want to lop off the top of this circle. Okay, well, this is what I do. I take my rectangle tool and I make it cover up the bit of the circle that I want to lop off. Okay, then I open my Pathfinder menu. All right. And you can see you have different options, unite minus front. OK, so if I select this square and this circle and click on minus front, off it goes. Yeah, I'm going to do that again over here on the side. By selecting first my trimming box and then my object and hit minus front. There you go. Now I'm going to make this uh, object a range, if you want to take it back step after step, I'll show you the layers palette soon, all right, but not right now. Uh, if I want to just go backward one step, it's control plus um, uh, the left hand bracket. I'm just going to hit this button right here, but okay. Let's hit control, left hand bracket. You can see it's going back step by step, as, and there we go. OK, I'm going to hit save. OK, that's enough for today.